Okay, so who is ready to learn about one of the most used sorting technique? Yes, I said it correct. Let's save the best one for the end. So quick sort, most of the library functions that you see that implement sort in many different languages, internally they use quick sort. So quick sort is one of the most used sorting algorithm. Why is it so attractive? What does it do different compared to all the other sorting that we have seen in this module? We have started by looking at searching algorithms, linear search, binary search. Then we looked at three basic sort algorithms such as selection sort, insertion sort, and the bubble sort. And after looking at selection bubble and insertion, those three type of basic sorts, then we looked into the merge sort which uses the technique of divide and conquer. It gives us, we looked into also the time complexity and space complexity of each of these algorithms that we discussed until now in this sorting module. So mod sort, it gave us just a quick recall. It gave us the time complexity of big O of n log n, and but the mod sort was not an in-place sorting algorithm. Rather than in place, it was out of out place, out of place sorting algorithm. And because of that, it required some additional space apart from the input data in order to perform the operations of merge sort. We divided things into two and then we stored that sub arrays individually into an additional memory space. Quick sort, on the other hand, is in place sorting algorithm. So you don't need additional space same as all the other algorithms of sorting we saw in this module, they are all in-place sorting algorithms. The auxiliary space cost is big O of one. In the same way, even for auxiliary space cost for quick sort is big O of one. That's the biggest advantage. You don't need extra space. And the space that you need, like in merge sort, the space that you need is of the order of N because uh, if your N is large, the additional space that you need also will be very large. So not having a requirement of needing additional space is something the biggest plus point of quick sort. On the other hand, in, time of, in terms of temporal complexity or the time efficiency of quick sort, it also does quite a good job. Now, why did I say quite a good job and not always the good job is because we will soon see after we see the algorithm of quick sort, the temporal complexity of quick sort is big O of n square in worst case. But on an average, so if we are looking at theta, the average cost of quick sort is n log n. So most of the cases, it will give you the average cost. So most of the cases, depending upon what data are you sorting, we'll further look into on what does it depend on what having average cost versus having the worst case cost depend when we look into the algorithm of quick sort. But in most of the cases, it's going to run at the cost of big, at the cost of n log n. But in worst case, it can be big O of n square. So there is a trade-off. So quick sort is mostly very good, but in worst case, it can go up to the cost of big O of n square. Let's look into what does quick sort do or what is the algorithm by itself. Again, let's start looking by taking an example. So let's take an example. Sixty eight, ninety, twenty nine, thirty four, seventeen. There are seven elements in our array. And our task is apply quick sort algorithm to sort this array. Now, how we apply that's how we will study what quick sort is doing or what's the logic behind quick sort. So in quick sort, first we go ahead and select a pivot. Pivot can be anything. 
you can select it randomly, but you need to have some deterministic order of selecting this pivot. For example, your pivot all can be always the last element of your array. So first we go ahead and select pivot. Once you have your pivot, then even for quick sort, same as merge sort, we will be using divide and conquer technique. And the algorithm that we'll see will also use recursion. Same as merge sort. But as opposed to mod sort, quick sort is in plate sorting algorithm. So first we went ahead and selected our pivot. Now, because now you know what is divide and conquer technique, right? I hope you remember from our last class of mod sort. So in divide and conquer, there is some logic we are going to apply to divide elements. And we keep dividing until we find the sub problem and until we know the solution of that sub problem. Once we know the solution of the sub problem, we do the conquer. So we dis design the conquer step in a way that if you have two sub problems and you know the solution of these two sub problems, then you can do something to know the solution of the original problem. So we are going to use that same technique over here. But how we are going to divide our elements is that we want to rearrange or relocate this element P, our pivot in such a way, position that in this array, such a way that after repositioning, all the elements towards in the left side of that P should be lesser than P. Doesn't matter those elements on the left side of P are in sorted order or unsorted order, but they should be less than P. And all the elements on the right side of that repositioned uh, element, they should be greater than P. In that way, if you have any um, array in which all the position towards the all the elements on the left of that array, left of that item in that array are smaller and all the items on the right of that, um, all, the all the items that are right of that particular item in that array are larger than what you can say by that. You can definitely say that that element is at its perfect position if it was a sorted array, right? Because in a sorted array, all the elements towards the left will be smaller than the element, any element, and all the elements towards the right will be greater than that element. So if we can preserve the property irrespective of what is the order of elements in this left subarray or the right subarray, if we can have elements that all are lesser than the pivot towards the left and elements, all the elements that are greater than pivot towards the right, then we can say, okay, then this element pivot is at the location where it needs to be in its sorted array. And we have figured out its correct position of that element of what it will be in a sorted array. So that's exactly how we are going to divide our array into two uh, different parts, the left part and the right part. How we do that is we take the pivot, we start from our beginning, so we have our start at zero. We have a start marker at zero. Our end marker is the last element. We will iterate from the start to n minus one, right? Because the last element is pivot, so we don't need to iterate until there. So we'll iterate from start until n minus one. And in this iteration, what we will do is we'll compare the element at, let's, let's have another index where we say that we maintain i. So we'll compare the element a of i 
with the pivot. While comparing, we'll see if a of i, right, if this element is smaller than equal to pivot, then let's say p is also index, then it's a of p. Is smaller than equal to a of p, then we will swap. But we are not swapping 17 with 89, but rather we are swapping 89 with another index that we are maintaining. And let's say we can maintain another pointer called P index. You will soon understand why we are maintaining this other pointer. We are doing all these steps in order to arrange the array in such a way that once we relocate our P from this last position to some new position, everything towards its left is smaller, everything towards its right is greater. So we'll compare A of I and A of P. And if A of I is smaller than A of P, then we'll swap A of I with A of P index. P index is a location where we want to shift P in our final, it's the final destination of P. And that will, we want to move this P index and arrange the array in such a way that we get to what our goal is. And if we swap, then we increment our P index is equal to P index plus one. And while doing this, let's see how, how it works. And then after, after this step, we will increment our i. So in first iteration, our a of i is, if it's smaller than a of p, then we'll increment, then we'll swap a of i and a of p index. But because our a of i is not smaller than a of p, so we'll just increment our i. Then we will compare this element, a of i, with a of p again. And if a of i is smaller than a of p, then we'll swap, but it is not. So we'll just simply increment our i. Even at this location, our a of i is not smaller than a of p. So we'll keep incrementing i until we find something that's smaller than a of p. If we don't, then we just move next. So in this case, even 29 is not smaller than 19. Then our next location of i will be this. Even 34 is not smaller than 19. And we were iterating i from um, start to i. In this case, because all our, we have seen all our elements and nothing is smaller than 19. So that means the correct position for this element 17 is wherever the p index is pointing to. So finally, we'll swap the item that's that whatever item p index is pointing to with whatever item p is pointing to. So finally, we'll have this swap call after a for loop of i. We'll have a swap call swap a of p index with a of p. And when we are done with this swap call, then you can just return the p index because that's the new position. That's the correct position of the pivot. So it will, doing this partitioning, it will position 17 over here and it will shift 89 after first it after this iteration it will shift 89 over here now in this step 
we partitioned the array in such a way that when we selected pivot as 17, then all the elements on the left of this is, unfortunately, we didn't have any elements that lesser than 17. So the left side of 17 is empty and the right side of 17 has all the elements that are greater than 17. Let's see how this works in case where we have some elements that are going to be towards the left and towards the right. So let's let's see one more. Let's take one more um, one a bit different example, just a small modification, and let's see how things work. So let's take eighty nine just to make things clear to you, because if you understand what we are doing here and why we are doing this, then you can automatically make your pseudocode and algor algorithm pseudocode and C++ code on your own. So let's take a number, say, what's your favorite number? Hmm. Let's take 50, right? So 50, we have some elements that are smaller than 50 and we have some elements that are greater than 50. So in this case, Now we are again doing the same thing. We are taking our pointer i, pointer p index, starting from our start location. This is our end location because we know the size of the array, you know your start and you know your end, we are assuming that. We take p as our last element. And then we are doing the same thing. So now what we do is we compare the item at A of I with the item at A of P. If this item is greater than this item, then we just increment our A of I. We don't do anything. Then again, we compare this item. Oops, that's the eraser. 45. Then again, we compare this item with this item, right? 45 is now not greater than 50. And because 45 is smaller than 50, so now we have to do swapping. And what we are swapping is the element that is at the, at the index A of P index, we are swapping it with A of I. So we'll swap this both. In a way, notice that wherever P index is going, we are trying to make a case where we are dividing everything lesser than the pivot at a location that's smaller than P index. And everything that's greater than P index, the greater than the pivot at the location that's on the right side of P index. And that's the reason we are doing this swap. So we swap these two and after we are, if we swap things, then we also increment our P index. Then we compare 89 with 50 because 89 is greater than 50. We won't swap things, we'll just increment our I. 68 with 50, 68 is greater than 50. So we don't swap things, we increment I. 90 is also greater than 50. So we don't swap anything. We increment our i. Finally, cell 29 is smaller than 50, and this is the time to swap things. So what we swap is a of p index with a of i. So our 29 will come here, and our 89 will go here. After we are done with the swapping, we'll increment our p index. Notice that P index is always pointing to an element that's greater than the pivot. And it's moving behind I. I is something that's doing the check. P index is maintaining this virtual boundary where it's ensuring that everything to the left of P index is smaller than whatever the pivot is pointing to that item and everything to the from the P index and the right of P index is greater. So now we compare the values of, again, 
a of i and a of p because a of i is greater than a of p. So we just increment our i. Finally, we compare the value of, again, a of i, a of p, 34 is smaller than, smaller than 50, and that's where we'll do the swap. We'll swap these two elements. So our 34 will come over here. And what was the element with that, that we had here? 68. And our 68 will go over here. After we are done with the swap, we'll increment our P index. And finally, because we reached our end minus one, that, that was the iteration loop of i from start to end minus one. We reached n minus one, there are no more elements. So finally at the end, after we exit that for loop of i, we exchange the element at p index and p. So if when we do this, we are placing the element that's the pivot at its correct location. This was 90. So now, do you notice that after doing all this, this is called partitioning. Let's call it partitioning. After running this partitioning process, now we have uh, 50 relocated from wherever the initial position was, which was last to its new location. And if we saw, if we sort this array, let's look at how would this array look when it's sorted. So it would look with 29, the smallest, 34, 45, 50, 68, 89, and 90. You see, in the sorted position, the position of whatever is the correct position of 50, that's the position we get after doing our partitioning algorithm. Because everything on the left of 50, irrespective of if it's arranged or not, that's definitely smaller than 50, and that's what it matters. Everything on the right of 50, although these elements are not arranged in a, in a sorted order, but still they are greater than 50. And that's what ensures that 50 as a, it is at its correct, correct location. So this is how we can partition things using quick sort. Now, after we have partitioned these things, um, after we have partitioned our array, into two different arrays. So let's call this as our left and this as our right. Can we do the similar process of partitioning in each of these sub arrays that we have framed? Yes, we can take the pivot P in each of these sub array and then we can do the same process where you can take P index i and then you compare your pivot with a of i if a of i is greater than p index p a, if a, a of i is greater than a of p then you just increment i if a of i is smaller than a of p then you exchange a of p index and a of i so in this case, as 29 is smaller than 34, we will exchange 29 and 45. And finally, because we are done, we have no more elements. So we'll swap A of P index and P where our p index was right here itself. So we are swapping a of p index and a of p. 34 will come over here. Mm, no, our p index incremented with one item. Let's go back, let's trace back. Okay, 
So we, because we swapped these items, we swapped A of P index and A of I. After this, we forgot one critical step of incrementing P index, right? We increment P index. And then that's when our for loop is done. At this time, when our for loop is done, finally, now because there is no more, uh, the loop of I has ended, that's where we'll swap the items of A of P index and A of P. So we are swapping 45 with 34. And now we have created new two sub arrays. This was the pivot, we have solved its position. In the same way for our left sub array, we can do the same thing. Now observe that all these steps we are doing in place. We are not using any new memory location or we are not using any extra space to do the steps. We are doing everything in the location of the array itself. We are not using any extra space. So now if P is this, let's say for this array, your uh, I will be this and your P index initially will be this. You compare 89 and 90, because 89 is smaller than 90, you exchange A of I and A of P index, both are pointing to the same element, it's the same exchange. But after that, you would increment your I and you would increment your, you would increment after the exchange, you will increment your P index. And we'll also increment our I after the exit, after we exit the outer for loop. Now we compare again A of I and A of P because A of I is smaller than A of P. So again, we swap our A of I with A of P index. Both of them, they're pointing to the same. So swapping element with element that at the same position, it will remain the same. And after the swap is done, we are incrementing our I and P of, um, we'll increment our I, but because this is our last there is nowhere else, like no more elements before the pivot. There is nothing to increment. So this is our last position. So we, we do not, in, we cannot increment i. i is ranging from zero to n minus one. But after we are done with like swapping of p index and a of i and a of p index, we increment our p index. So this is the final state where both the loops will be completed. At this stage, we swap A of P with A of P index. Again here, luckily, both of them are pointing to the same element and 90 is at its correct location. If you see in the sorted array, 90 is the biggest element and that's the reason we, are, we don't need to swap it with anything else. It's already at its correct location. After we are done with that, we are done with solving this and we are left with this sub array. So now we have three sub arrays left where our one sub array is just of one element, 29. One element is sorted by itself. So we don't have to do anything. Our second sub array is 45. 45 is sorted by itself. So we don't have to do anything. Our third sub array is having two elements. So we will, uh, we will do the same process. We'll take this as P, this as I, this as P index. And then you compare A of I and A of P. If your A of I is greater than A of P, then you don't have to swap, you just increment your I. But here you have nowhere else to increment i because there are only two elements and i starts from start to n minus one. Your n minus one is already done. So then your both the loops are completed. And finally, you will, you will exchange the elements 
at the location of A of P and A of P index. So we are exchanging these both elements. We are following the same logic. 8068 and 89. And that's it. After we are done, now we have no more sub arrays. After we are done with this, then we are done with selecting this as pivot, then we'll be left with only one more sub array, which is single element sub array. So it's sorted by itself. And that's it. Then we say that, okay, now we are done with everything. And this array, that's the result, should be the sorted array. This is your quick sort algorithm working. An example of quick sort algorithm sorting an array, all from beginning until the end. So, what are different steps that we did? We did the partition step, right, where we rearrange the things like having that A of I, A of P index, having A of P, and then swapping the concept. So, that's one of the things that you should capture in your pseudocode. So, you'll have a function called partition. What other things did we do? We did the divide step. And by now you should know in order to do the divide step, what can we use? Recursion, correct. So in order to do the divide step, we can use recursion. So first, when we started, we took the whole array. We initialized our pivot. So we started with a partition step. Inside the partition step, you can initialize your pivot. You can initialize all that I, P index, those two index and then do your partition step where you at the last of at the end of partition you will swap your a of p index with a of p and after that swap your pivot is at its correct location once our pivot was at its correct location then we got a clue of how we can subdivide things that things on its left and things on its right into two independent problems so once we have these two independent problems, you can run quick sort itself from the beginning, the start to pivot minus one and from pivot plus one to the end, right? So if you pass these arguments to the quick sort, it will perform the same algorithm on the left sub array and the same algorithm on the right sub array. And that's exactly the recursive call that we are going to make. So let's do that. If we have to write algorithm for our quick sort, now after looking at example, you should be able to write this algorithm or you should be able to help me while writing this algorithm. You should have your thought process running like horses. First, what we did is select a pivot P. This could be, for example, the last element. Then the second step, we did rearrange the list or the array such that A of I is less than equal to P and A of J is greater than equal to P, which means all the elements on left of P are smaller than P and all the elements on right of P are greater than P. This is exactly our partition algorithm. Then once we are done with such division of array, then 
the last, then the third step that we did is exchange. The pivot, let's say that P is an index. So then we can say A of P is the item that we are looking. Exchange the A of P with the first element of the second sub array. So we divided things into two sub arrays and P index was our virtual boundary that was separating these two sub arrays. Everything to the left of our P index was smaller than P and everything to the right of our P index was greater than P. So finally, we exchanged the element at our P index with element at our P. So this is the step that we exchanged swap A of I index, uh, A of P index with A of P. After we are done with these three steps, the final step, we need to do this for the sub arrays also. So sort the two sub array recursively. The word recursively means after after while we were sorting the left sub array and right sub array after the first iteration, we further decided the pivot, we found the correct position for pivot, we further divided into multiple and we'll keep on doing that until our array or the sub problem is just one element. When the sub problem is just one element, you know that that's already sorted. So you don't need to do anything further and that's how we will end it. Just a minute. Let's see if we can add some light. While I'm adding light, um, I want you guys to think on, now this is the algorithm of this, take this algorithm and try to write your own pseudocode. Start writing with writing the pseudocode of this function partition, right? Partition, we are taking array. A, we are taking the start, which is the in the partitioned array um, from where you want to start your I and P index. And we are taking end. So where you want to end your I is end minus one. So these are start and end of your partitioned array. We are taking these, these three things as your input write this function partition to do the operations that we just discussed while running an example. Okay. Have you made progress? Are you done? Already you have your pseudocode? I wish you do. 
because by now you should be after tracing that example, which we trace the steps from the beginning to end, you should be able to make your own pseudocode with that. It's exactly the logical steps that we would do. So first, while we were doing and while we were running things in example, we selected pivot. So let's say pivot P is equal to N, pivot as a last element. And let's say P index is equal to start. That's our first element. Then we have a for loop of from I equals to start. That's the first element of the sub array that we are partitioning to n minus one because last element end uh, a of end is our pivot itself. So we don't need to run i until n. We just need to run i until n minus one. Inside this for loop, what we are doing is we are checking if a of i is lesser than equal to a of p. We are checking if a of i is lesser than equal to a of the item at pivot. If it is lesser than the item at pivot, then we enter this if loop. And in that case, we are swapping. We are, no, we are swapping nothing with P. We don't touch that element until the last step of our partitioning. But what we do is we swap items between A of I and A of I index or P index. So swap. So we are preparing the location of A of, uh, we are preparing the location of P index in such a way that that location will finally, after we are done with this for loop, it will point to a location where the item that's pointed by pivot needs to be. And then only in the last iteration, we'll be swapping A of P index and A of P. So in this iteration, here, if a of i is smaller than a of p, then we swap a of i with a of p index. In this way, you are ensuring that every all the elements that are on the left of a of p index are smaller than a of p. a of p is your pivot pointed item and you are ensuring that all the elements to the right of A of P index are greater than whatever your pivot is pointing to. If you do the swap of A of I and A of P index, then you increment your P index by one. Finally, we close the for loop this for loop will automatically in increment the index of i by one because it starts from start and it ends at n minus one with incrementing the i by one at every iteration. After we are done with this for loop, when i reaches n minus one and there is no other element at that time, after we exit this for loop, then finally we swap a of p with A of P index. And because now we have found the correct location of our pivot element, right? And after this, we want to subdivide things into, into our original array into two sub arrays with all the elements on the right of this correct index of the pivot on all the elements on the left of this correct item uh, pointed by pivot. So we will return our P index. Notice that in this step where we swapped, we swapped the items pointed by these two pointers, but we didn't swap the pointers themselves. So P index is still pointing to the location where the pivot should be belonging. That's why we are returning P index.
that's it so this is your partition code next we are not yet done we need to write our quick sort code the quick sort code will take array a as input it will take um we actually in most of the previous sorting algorithms what did we take apart from array a the size n but here because we can take size n and you can find out your start pointer and the end pointer or directly you can take your left pointer because think when you are going to recursive recall quick sort you have a single array where you are returning the correct position of a pivot when you call partition function now after calling partition function you have this pivot that's dividing your array into two left sub array and right sub array in this left sub array next when you want to call re quick sort recursively from the element that's at the left most in the left sub array until the element that's p minus 1 and you want to call the for the right sub array you want to call the quick sort for p plus 1 until the end so somehow you are using the pointers right the start pointer and the end pointer for all the functions and that's why it will make easy rather than just passing the size or rather than assuming having size as your input argument directly having your left and right pointer so left and right pointer as your input argument inside quick sort what we are doing is whenever we have a recursive function two things is most important first we need to have base case of when that recursion will end second whenever we call a recursive function don't call it so calling a recursive function recursive function is a function calling itself within it when we are calling a function within the function itself the arguments of the function needs to be different so these two are most important things so let's first make our base case our base case is nothing but we have two um left and right pointers over here so we say when our left is if our left is lesser than right then we have something to do whenever our left becomes equal to right that means we just have one single element right if there is only one element let's say 49 that's always sorted by itself and for a single element its left and its right will be pointing to the same location so when this is the case in that case that's our base case and that's where we exit because one element is always sorted by itself until our left is smaller than right we are definitely sure that we have elements more than one it can be 2 3 4 n who knows but something more than one and that's when we keep doing until that's the case we keep doing this whatever we want to do in quick sort the first thing what we want to do in quick sort is decide the location of our pivot so let's say p is equal to partition or not to confuse with the p let's call it item p that's the value of the uh, whatever the pivot is pointing to oh we are returning what we are returning in in our partition we are returning index okay so because we are returning index let's just take value take let's just take it as index so p is index which is partition and we are calling partition we are passing a the original array to that we are passing the left and we are passing the right this is not the recursive call this is function we are calling function partition the function that we designed right here from quick sort and after we are done with calling partition right whatever is the result of this partition it will return the partition function is going to return us p index 
And once we have this P index into our P over here, then we want to further divide and recursively call the same function quick sort over the divided arrays. What we did, first we had elements like seven elements array. We divided into wherever the original location of the partition, the pivot took us. And then we took the left subarray of the pivot, the right subarray of the pivot. We did the same thing. Then we took the pivot in both the subarrays. We kind of found the correct position for that. Again, we did the same thing until we just had one element in the sub problem. And whenever we had one element that will hit our base case and this uh, recursion will exit by itself. So next we want to call quick sort recursively. What we'll be passing is array A. This is in place sorting algorithm. So we are not making any new space for array. We are just using array A by itself. But the index that we are passing here is for our left, we are passing our left and we are passing our P minus one. P is the result that we get from our partition. So that's how we make our left sub array, right? In an array, if your P is an item over here, then in your next iteration, you want this as your left sub array and this as your right sub array. So we are going from left to P minus one. And we'll have one more call for the right sub array, which is quick sort array A. Now our left, the start index of the right subarray is P plus one and the end index is right. We'll keep doing this recursively until so these both statements will execute. And after that, again, for each subarray, we'll find, we'll declare its pivot. Uh, we will uh, find, we'll partition the new sub arrays and find the pivot location in that. And then again, partition the elements from there and so on and so forth. And that's it. So once there is only single element, the recursion will exit. And then automatically, once you do the conquer steps of recursion, finally, you should have your all sorted array as we did in that example. If this process of how quick sort is processing different if the steps of how quick sort is processing different items is confusing to you i highly recommend take one more example make your own favorite array take one more example take all unsorted elements in the array and try to manually trace the process now if you know the pseudocode you know the algorithm you can definitely manually trace the process do the partition with your hand do the steps over here with your hand and that will help you to understand the overall concept or the logic of quicksort in a much better way. Next, let's look at the temporal um, complexity of quicksort. Time complexity. As initially before starting the topic, we already said that the worst case time complexity of the quick sort is big O of n square. When would that happen? Let's say if the array that we are sorting is already sorted, something like, let's say the array that we are sorting is one, five, nine, 50. In that case, what will happen here is your pivot initially will be this, but because the correct position of pivot is right that same position itself. So when you are dividing your element, how you are dividing the element is you are dividing the element after finding the correct position of the pivot, the elements towards the left and elements towards the right becomes individual two sub problems, right? Now, if these two sub problems are of same size, 
then can you imagine, can you um, think of the similarity with the mod sort, right? In mod sort, we divided the array by the, our midpoint was n by two. So we always divided things in the factor of two. And at the end, because we are dividing things at, with the factor of two, we ended up having log to the base two n multiplied by n. So n log n complexity. So if even in quick sort, if the pivot that we select is a good one and it's able to almost divide the original problem size into two equal sub problems every time the division happens. And after this, again, we select pivot in this sub problems and then that divides it further, right? So every time we are dividing, if the division happens into two equal sub problems, then our cost is similar to mod sort is big O of n log n. But in this case, we won't call it big O, but let's call it average cost, which is theta of n log n. But if our pivot doesn't divide it into two equal sized sub problems, like in this case, in this example of if we have input of already sorted array, then in that case, our sub problem one is of size n minus one. And our sub problem two is of size zero, right? Then in this sub problem one, you will select P over here. And then the next sub problem is again of the uh, size n minus two. And then the sub problem of the size n minus three, something like this. But as you see over here, our sub problem two is of size zero for all this iterations. And in that case, you still have to do n steps because you are not dividing. Your task is to sort everything, right? If you can divide this big task into two small tasks, and then you further divide this two small task into four small tasks. And if you keep on doing the same thing, then you are progressing with that log to the base two, because every time you're dividing with a factor of two, that aspect, that scale. But when you divide, if you're not able to divide it efficiently into this two equals or almost equal sides of problem, but rather your division is happening into just one big problem with just one element less. And then the other sub problem is of size zero. And then you are having this, again, a new problem with just one element less and the other sub problem is of the size zero as what's, what is happening over here. Then you are not making progression faster. And in that case, the number of steps that you have will be n because every time you are just reducing the problem size by one. So you need to perform n steps to process all your elements, to sort all our elements. And this is the concept why the efficiency of quick sort depends upon how we select our pivot. If we can select our pivot efficiently, if the pivot is almost able to divide the problem into two sub problems every, in every iteration, then our efficiency is equal, almost equal to n log n. Otherwise, if we are not able to divide, this is the worst case. In that case, our efficiency is big O of n square. Let's see, this is what we saw by example and, and got to know the efficiency by intuition. Let's see how we will exactly calculate the efficiency. So let's first calculate the efficiency of our partition algorithm. Here we can say that these two steps and these steps, they are of constant cost. Let's say cost. C1. And cost C2. Now inside the for loop, we are doing these steps. So all the steps that we are doing inside for loop, let's say they are costing us C3. 
And these steps we need to do n times because this for loop is going from start until end. So it's going over all the items, just one less, but still that can be neglected as constant. We are finding the worst case cost. So our iteration is going over almost all the items of the array. So the C3 is multiplied by n. So your cost of partition algorithm is C3n or nc3 plus C1 plus C2, which you, we can say as constants, like we can combine this constant into one. So we can represent the same equation as saying as C1, C2, C3 can be any constant, right? So I can write the same equation saying nc1 plus C2 simplistically where C1 and C2 and C3, they are some constants. So the order of this is big O of N. Here, when I wrote this equation to that, um, we assume that these C1 and C2 are different than this C1 and C2, they're not the same. But what we are finding is the order of our partition algorithm and the order of our partition algorithm is big O of N. Then let's come to the quick sort. So let's say the cost of quick sort is T of N. Now, what's the information that we know? We know that when T, when N is equal to one, right? When there is only one element, then that element is sorted by itself. So T of one is constant. And the cost of that is just one because it's sorted by itself. Now, if we have to write the cost of this algorithm over here, we know that the cost or the time that the partition takes is n, is of the order of n, which we can say as nc1 plus c2. The time that this call would take, so if the time that the quicksort takes is t of n, then the time the quicksort um, recursive will take, it depends upon what is your left and what is your p minus 1. If you're left and P minus one, if your pivot was dividing the array into two sub problems, then this would be T of N by two, and this would be T of N by two. And then similar to merge sort, we will get the derivation of big O of N log N. But here we don't know that will the pivot always divide it into T of N by two or not. And we saw in worst case, it will just divide it into one element less for one sub problem. So because we are finding the worst case, let's see that. And in that case, this will be T of N minus one. And this will be just the constant because the another, the sub problem two is of size zero. So this will not take any time. So what we get is T of N is equal to T of n minus one plus nc one plus c two. This is our equation. Now, if you recursively replace the equation for t of n minus one, right? You know the equation for t n. So, if we recursively um, try to solve this equation until we reach t of one, then in the second iteration we'll have if what will be t of n minus one, t of n minus one can be expanded further as t of n minus two following the same um, equation plus nc one plus c two. This is your t of n minus one. And these are the terms that you already have and that you bring, bring from top. That is nc one plus c two. So after your second iteration, you have T of N minus two plus two N C one plus two N two C two. So let's combine these constants and write it as two N C one plus two C two. In the same way, if you again expand T of N minus two, you will end up with something like 
t of n minus 3 plus 3nc1 plus 3c and so on. If you keep on going at a point because you are decreasing n, eventually you should reach n equals to 1, right? Because you are decreasing every time with 1. So eventually after let's say k iterations, you will reach n equals to 1. In that case, you can say that generically after k iteration, you will be reaching a point t of n minus k plus 3. Uh, it won't be 3, but it will be because this is increasing in the order. So we can say that is equal to kcn, right? This is increasing by 1 plus but this term will be increasing by multiple because next time when you replace the multiple of three also will be there. So that's increasing by K of K minus one by two, the, the constant. So after K iteration, you will have this as your result. And let's say after K iteration, you reach one. So N minus K is equal to one. In that case, you can further replace this with, let's do it in the next slide. Nope. Okay, let's just do it over here. I'm jumping here from this step. So we are replacing T of one and minus K is one plus your k into n. Now, if n minus k is 1, your k is equal to n minus 1, right? And n minus 1 into n is nothing but order of n square, right? If you want, we can write it as n minus 1 into n c plus again k into k. So k is n minus 1 into n minus 2 divided by 2. Here, if you see this, this is your t of n equation after k iterations, where you reach, where you see that after k iterations, you reach t of 1. And if you observe this, this and this, both, both these are the terms of the order of n squared. And because we are finding worst case complexity, so our t of n will be of the order of big O of n square. This is how you derive the time complexity cost. So finally, quick sort is a in place sorting algorithm. So let's discuss the space complexity. As we mentioned earlier, it's in place sorting algorithm. This means that we do not need any additional array as we needed, like um, as we initialized multiple uh, intermediate arrays while we were doing mod sort. While doing quick sort, you do not need explicit additional arrays or any other data structure that you need to store in memory. But um, it is in place sorting algorithm, but because it's a recursive uh, sorting algorithm or at least the implementation that we did is, a recur is in recursive fashion, they can be the same application that you can write pseudocode and program in many different ways. So one of the implementation that we did is in a recursive fashion, right? In our quick sort, we are calling the quick sort function inside itself recursively. Every time any recursive function is called, we do allocate an explicit uh, function called stack, where you push the function with its arguments of every call instances. So first when it was called, it will 
push argument one, second time argument two, and so on and so forth. So whenever any function returns, then that uh, item gets popped from the stack. And in that way, our system inherently maintains the recursive call stack. So because quicksort is implemented here the way we did in a recursive fashion, it needs this recursive call stack while it's running. And this is something additional apart from the input size that um, the space, like additional memory that's required apart from the input size. That's where the auxiliary space complexity or the auxiliary space that's required to perform <coughs> quick sort. In the way we did, way we implemented over here. In worst case, your one of the after partition, after you relocate the pivot in worst case, your one I, one side of the um, division divided elements will have just one less element and the other side will be empty, right? That's the imbalanced way of that partitioning example. You can almost always avoid that worst case in by selecting your pivot more smartly. But in case if you end up in that worst case, then every time when you're calling these two function recursively over here, recursive quick sort for the left array and the recursive quick sort for the right array, the number of times you need to call this recursive function in worst case, that will be of the order of N because every time you're just reducing the item by one. And when you make n calls to the quick sort recursively, you need to allocate n stacks for that. So in worst case, in the of the implementation of the quick sort that we saw here, that will have auxiliary space consumption of big O of n. But almost with like selecting pivot smartly with most of the cases with most of your input example if your data is random and unsorted then this worst case can be avoided and averagely your cost will be log n because in the in an average case you would be able to divide the array into two almost equal parts and then the number of times you need to call quick sort will be lesser than n and that will be in the order of log to the base two of n if we are divided into almost two equal parts. So almost uh, most of the time in quick sort, you are able to get the space complexity of log to the base two n. But in worst case, if you don't do any optimization, then it can go up to n. Now, uh, that being said, even in worst case, if you implement quick sort with a small uh, smart modifications, such as if you use the tail recursion optimization, and if we ensure that the smaller half of array. So if we don't divide the array in a proper way, then the smaller half has just the zero element. So if we ensure that the smaller half of the array is sorted first, then in that case, um, because then you don't, the smaller half of the array does not have any element. So you don't have to allocate stack for that. And just with such minor optimizations where your tail recursion optimization is implemented when you are you usually compile your program using GCC compiler, right? The compiler has some optimization flags which you can use. So if you use an optimization flag like O2, it will automatically do the recursive tail, uh, tail recursive optimization inside it. 
but you if you use optimization or want then it does not do that so there are some smart ways in which the space the worst case space auxiliary space complexity of quick sort can be moved from big o of n to big o of log n that's it so that's a uh, that's all we have for today on the quick sort and if you have any questions please see me in my office hours thank you <laughs>